you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hello everyone, you've had a couple weeks to recover from that fluid responsiveness coma that Mike put you in last podcast. You laughed, you cried, you saw the light. <laughs> so we're going to do part two. We showed you how to do it. We ended last week with a little demonstration. We're going to start off with that again, demoing exactly how to do this, and then we're going to kind of bring it home. For all you insomniacs out there, if you're looking for something to help put you back to sleep, we're going to get back to fluid response. That's not true. This stuff is riveting. Oh, riveting indeed. You're going to love it. So here you go. Riveted. Hey, so this is Mike Mallon. This is uh, Val Kilmer, who's uh, come with us today uh, to help out with this procedure. So first I'm going to start off by showing you how to put the information in the machine itself. So here I've just put in patient ID, example cardiac output. Uh, of course, our patient's name is Val Kilmer. And then the only thing I really want to add in here is that we're going to put in the patient's heart rate. So we're going to say for uh, uh, argument's sake that his heart rate right now is 65, although normally I'd want to look at the monitor. And then once I've got that all in there, I'm just going to go ahead and start with my exam here. So we're going to do a ca adult cardiac mode, and that tells the machine that we're going to actually do some measurements using the cardiac mode. So if you set it for endo endocavitary, I'm leaving. <laughs> so we'll do the endocavitary example in a minute. Uh, first to start, we're going to uh, we're going to start here with the apical long axis view. So to perform this view, I'm going to put the probe right here in the patient's third to fourth intercostal space. So we've got the probe marker pointed towards the patient's right shoulder. So here, let's take a look at the screen, and this is what we're looking at. And I pretty much get this view almost instantaneously. I might have to twist the probe a little bit to the right or left in order to get it, but here we have it right now. And I'm going to go ahead and freeze this window. And what I want to do is I want to find that point when the two aortic valve leaflets are completely open. So here you can see they're closed by that white line right there. Here we go into systole. And as we go into systole, we can see that the two leaflets are open, and you can see the leaflet right there. See that little, that little dash of white. So now I'm going to hit the measure button, and after I hit the measure button, I'm going to go over and choose left ventricular outflow tract diameter. Okay. Now remember, this is to measure the cardiac output, so I need to know the area of the LVOT, and that's measured by getting the diameter. So here I'm going to measure that diameter in systole, and I found that diameter to be 2.3 centimeters. Okay. So here, that's our LVOT diameter. So that's all I need in this view. So for the next view, I'm going to need the patient's LVOT VTI. And to get that, I'm going to find my apical four-chamber view. So I started just under the patient's uh, nipple is a good place to start. I've got the pro marker pointed towards the patient's axilla. And I'm just going to go ahead and try to find that four-chamber view. So here we see on the screen, here we've got sort of the four-chamber view. This is the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the right atrium, and the left atrium. Now if you watch the probe, what I'm going to do is just basically rotate the probe about 90 degrees so that it's now pointing back towards his right shoulder. And when I do that, if you look again at the screen here, you'll see what's called the apical long axis. And that's basically the same view as we just had a minute ago when we were measuring the LVOT, but now we're looking at it from the apex. And what I'm going to do is measure the velocity of the blood cells going through this left ventricular outflow tract. So here I'm going to hit pulse wave, put the pulse wave gate right, just proximal, just apical to that aortic valve, and I'm going to hit pulse wave again. So now what we have is the velocity of blood cells as they're going through the left ventricular outflow tract. I'm going to hit measure again, go over here to, in, on this particular machine, the LVOT VTI is under aorta. I choose LVOT VTI, manual measurement. And what I'm going to do is I'm just basically going to trace that VTI right here. And you can see I'm just tracing it with the trackball. And once we have that traced, I hit set again, and it tells me the LVO VTI is 18.84 centimeters. So now I could just use my calculator and say the VTI is 18.84 centimeters, the LVOT diameter is 2.3 centimeters, and I could pretty much figure out my cardiac output or my stroke volume. In this case, I'm just going to hit report, and it's going to do all those measurements for me. So LVOT diameter, 2.3 centimeters, LVOT VTI, 18.84, which gives me a stroke volume of 79.92 mils. And voila, there's your stroke volume. Multiply that by 65 and you've got your cardiac output. Thanks. Now for the endocavitary probe. 
All right, so now let's, uh, now that I've shown you how to perform all these measurements, let's do a little practice. What are we talking about? Practice? We're talking about practice, man. <laughs> We're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. We ain't talking about the game. We're talking about practice. Here's an example. We've got an LVOT diameter of 2.14 centimeters, which we have the uh, picture here in the top right. And then we have a VTI of 23.3 centimeters, which we have on the bottom right. So I've got all the data that I need. I've got those two pieces of, of important information, and all I have to do is plug them into my uh, iPhone calculator, and voila, I've got a cardiac output. So some of these machines even do this for you, where they can actually uh, just sort of spit it out once you put in the measurements. But we're going to do it. We're going to do it right in front of you now, so you know how easy it is. So LVOT diameter is. 2.14 and VTI is 23.3. So I know my stroke volume is that VTI, which is 23.3, times pi, which is 3.14, times one half of that diameter squared, which is 1.07. I thought pi was 3.14159263. You're confusing me. Oh, you left a couple on the end there. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Can you keep going with that? <laughs> Actually, that's as far as I can go, sorry. All right, so if I do that equation, 23.3 times 3.14 times 1.07 squared, I've got 83 milliliters. So my stroke volume is 83 milliliters. Every time the heart beats, it's kicking out 83 milliliters. And then if I, me if I multiply that by 60 beats per minute, it's about 5 liters per minute. So the cardiac output in this patient is 5 liters per minute. Wow. Non-invasively. You just like touch their chest with a probe and you've gotten this <laughs> magic number. You just That's wave incredible. the probe in their direction and voila, you have a cardiac output. It's I mean, awesome. there's a few complicated steps kind of along the way that seem complicated, but I think you're right. I think after I put these numbers in three or four times that I could remember how to do it, I'll probably have to refresh my memory the first few times, but that'd be, it's pretty sweet to be able to get a cardiac output non-invasively. Yeah, it's kind of awesome. I mean, when you're talking about really sick patients, and then like all of a sudden you can you can see how everything that you do is affecting the patient. I mean, you can do this with more than just passive leg raise. You can start the patient on dobutamine and see how their cardiac output responds to dobutamine. Or when you start them on levofed, see how it changes. I mean, you can really see the effects of everything that you do in a, in a sick septic patient. So now that I've got a cardiac output, how is that going to help me manage the patient? All right. So here we go. So uh, multiple studies suggest that the validity of a passive leg raise testing is pretty good in spontaneous breathing. And here's one of them. This is a study that was in intensive care medicine in 2007. And they basically came to the conclusion that in spontaneously breathing patients, an increase of cardiac output by 5% with a passive leg raise makes you a fluid responder. So, so, you, so I measure this cardiac output, output then I do the passive leg raise, I measure it again, and if it changes more than 5%, then that means their heart liked that extra 500 cc's. Exactly. And they're going to like a 500 cc's in their IV. Exactly. So that's, and that's, that's with a pretty high sensitivity. So that's a 94% sensitivity. I think the better way to do this is with 10%. So if the cardiac output increases 10%, you're going to increase your specificity to about 95%, which is probably a little bit more important in this patient population. And so I'm assuming if their cardiac output actually decreased or they quit breathing, then I should put their legs down. If they quit breathing, you should probably put their legs down. That's okay. an excellent assumption, Matt. And maybe intubate them uh, and consider something doing. And I should put their legs down uh, without even going through all the, the, those measurements to get the cardiac output? <laughs> that, that would be an excellent okay. plan. All right, great. <laughs> all right. The other people have looked at this with the aortic flow, too, and they found that just the velocity going through the aortic valve, uh, basically, if that increases by greater than 10% with a passive leg raise, then the patient is also a fluid responder, and they had a really good sensitivity and specificity of 97 and 94, respectively. The problem with this is, and the reason I'm not teaching you guys how to do aortic flow, is that you have to have continuous wave Doppler to measure the velocity through the aortic valve, and uh, we, you, most machines don't have that. I think we have it in our in our place, um, but most most of the machines out there right now are not doing continuous wave Doppler. So your echo text can do this, but you probably can't really get it get it done at the bedside. So in summary, we're going to obtain a baseline cardiac output because why not? 
we're gonna raise the legs up and repeat that cardiac output. We're gonna see if the cardiac, incre cardiac output increases by 10 to 12%, and if it does, we're gonna give them fluid. Wait a second, what was that 5%? I don't the 5% five. is high sensitivity, so we're going with 10. That was just what their, their paper showed, 5% high sensitivity. We're going with 10% because specificity is more important. So what if the cardiac output increases by 7%? Do you want me to give them fluid or not? You're going to have to make that decision for yourself. <laughs> Jeez. I'm calling you if that happens. You call me. I'll, I won't answer. All right. So we've gone through a lot here. Let's try to break this down into something memorable. Let's try to break this down into something that we can take to the bedside. So when can I use IVC? When can I use the passive leg raise? And when should I use the uh, CVP? So... IVC, you can use it in mechanically ventilated patients all the time. So the IVC distendability index greater than 18% makes patients a fluid responder. That is pretty pretty accurate. I think that's fine to use any time. Now in spontaneously breathing patients, things become a little bit more hairy because the data is not really there in the literature. I think it's reasonable, and I, you know, I don't have much backing me on this, but I think it's reasonable that uh, IVC collapsing greater than 50% means they need more preload. Now you might not get fluid responsiveness out of it. They might not increase their cardiac output, but something else that you're going to do, i.e. start pressors, is probably going to increase their cardiac output, and we should not really do that if they don't have a decent amount of preload. So I think that an IVC collapsing greater than 50% means give them more fluid. Now, when can you use the passive leg raise? And I think the answer to this question is whenever you want. I think that the passive leg raise is awesome. It's been validated in mechanically ventilated and spontaneously breathing patients. And it's a little bit more time consuming than just looking at the IVC. But if it's giving you better data, then I think we should probably be doing it. So. I mean, I, I like the IVC. I look at the IVC. If it's collapsing more than 50%, I give the patient fluid. You're telling me, so why should I do the passive leg raise in that patient? In the patient who has an IVC that's less than 50%, I don't think you necessarily do. No, collapsing greater than 50%. Collapsing greater than 50%. Right, collapsing greater than 50%, I don't think you necessarily have to do the passive leg raise. Okay. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to bust an algorithm out on you, and you'll see what, see what we think. So when can you do the CVP? And I think the answer to this is pretty much you can't. So CVP is not that helpful when it comes to fluid responsiveness, but I think at the same time, I've got to be reasonable about this. If the CVP is low, if you are doing invasive monitoring and the CVP is low, then it's probably reasonable to give the patient fluid because we do need to fill the tank, right? But otherwise, as far as fluid responsiveness, the data shows that CVP is not helpful. So. These are two different algorithms that I've created. One's for mechanical ventilated patients and one is for spontaneously breathing patients. And hopefully uh, everyone will totally disagree with me on this and we'll have some awesome conversation about it. I would not expect anything else. So mechanically ventilated patients, I like to break it down between cardiac dysfunction or normal cardiac function. So uh, I think that there's an important difference here. So if the heart's not beating well, your IVC is probably not the best way to go because your IVC really only tells you what's the preload to the right side of the heart. But if you don't have a normal functioning heart, that might not be very helpful as far as what's the preload to the left side of the heart. So let me stop you there. I, I, when I, how am I going to tell the patient coming in if they have normal or abnormal cardiac function? I'm just talking about doing a quick echo. You're already you're already either looking at the IVC or or the the cardiac output, so you're already looking at the heart basically. Just take a look at it. Is it squeezing well? Is the RV big and dilated? Or is there you know a flattened septum? Um, so and, you're not telling me I have to do a bunch of measurements. No, 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 no. I'm this. saying I'm, I'm saying, just saying, looking at the heart. No, you're just looking at the heart. And you're saying, you know what? That looks like a normal functioning heart, or maybe that looks like a hyperdynamic left ventricle. I think those two things are very helpful in this patient population. Whereas if somebody has a big dilated heart that's barely squeezing, they're clearly having cardiac dysfunction. So throw the probe on their heart. If it looks good, I go down the, the right side of this pathway. Right. And if it looks bad, you go down the left side of the pathway. Okay. So the right side of the pathway is they've got a normal functioning heart. And I think in mechanically ventilated patients, I think we've made a decent argument to say that IVC, IVC distensibility is a reasonable way to go. So if it the IVC distends more than 18%, you give them a fluid bolus. 
if the IVC distends less than 18%, you can probably go ahead and start those patients on pressure, pressors. If you want to get a little bit more detail, you could go over and do the passive leg raise like we're showing here. I think, however, in the cardiac dysfunction patient, I think you're going to get a lot more value out of knowing uh, how they're going to respond to that fluid bolus. So if their heart is not functioning well, I really don't know what, where they are on the Frank Starling curve. So then I think it's much more reasonable to perform a passive leg raise. And in the passive leg raise case, if their cardiac output is less than 12%, you put them on pressors. If their cardiac output increases by more than 12%, you give them another fluid bolus. It's that simple. So that's mechanical ventilation. And then the the algorithm doesn't really change too much for spontaneous ventilation, except for the in the case of the IVC. So I think same thing. We're gonna we're gonna break it up between normal cardiac function and abnormal cardiac function. And in the normal function side, I'm gonna be a little bit more delicate about how I use that IVC. So I think if the IVC collapse is greater than 50%, you're safe to go ahead and give them a fluid bolus. Because like I was saying before, they don't have enough preload on board. Their CVP is definitely less than 8. And I think that that's, that's sort of helpful in the sense that whether the fluid increases their cardiac output or whether I give them the fluid bolus and nothing happens and I still end up putting them on pressors, either way, we still need to fill the, fill the tank. Whereas if the IVC collapse is less than 50%, I really think we need to look deeper. And in th that case, we go over and do the passive leg raise. Same thing for the cardiac dys dysfunction patient. I think we go straight to the passive leg raise. And in that case, if cardiac out output doesn't uh, increase by 12%, then we give them flu we put them on pressors. If it increases by 12% or more, we uh, give them a fluid bolus. Okay, so give them a fluid bolus. However, when we first started talking about this, we were talking about how much fluid. Is there any literature on that? Is there anything to say if the cardiac output changes a certain amount, we should give them more or less fluid? Or do you think we have to just do the... 500 cc's because that's what we tested them with and then try it again kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think you're probably safe around, at around a liter and that's kind of how I do this. So when when I find that their cardiac output changes by you know greater than 10 or 12 percent, I'll give them a liter of fluid, um, which is probably a reasonable amount and then sort of reassess. Then you're going to do another passive leg raise or? Yeah. All right. So that's that's uh, that's what we got. What do you what do you think, Matt? You think I'm crazy? No, I can't wait. I mean, I'm just, uh, the whole time that you're talking about this, I'm just thinking about how cool I'm going to look raising everybody's legs in the department, how awesome it's going to be when uh, everybody asks me what I'm doing, and I look at them like, what are you talking about what I'm doing? Passive leg raise, come on, do with the program. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just picturing all the patients in the emergency department with their legs up, and everybody echoing every patient. It's going to be so, so sweet. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, we'd love to hear what you guys have to think. Uh, please write us. Uh, don't be too nasty in your emails. Uh, not too much profanity, please. But uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts.
you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it.